March Madness means uh, so much to so many, and for you Trojan faithful, of course, on the ladies' side, and uh, expecting a long and prosperous uh, deep run in the NCAA tournament. We talk football, though, tonight, of course, here on Trojan Conquest Live, right here at the Boys of College Football, coming your way at 7 Pacific, as we do each and every Monday, so make it a habit with Matt Zemek to one side, Tim Prangley to the next both teaming up there at Trojans Wire, of course. Guys, how are we doing tonight? Fabulous. Doing Thanks. Well, it, and hey, I just want to say Mark Rogers is the number one seed of YouTube football show hosts in honor of the USC women getting a number one seed. That is very nice. Nice of you to say. We we had a fun time a couple hours ago, folks. If you would like to check it out and join the fun, what I did is I set up three separate NCAA like tournaments. One was strictly the basketball tournament that unfolded, of course, uh, starting tonight uh, with the first four. So we went through those, but then I also replaced all the non FBS basketball programs with a football equivalent that was the closest geographically to set up a football bracket that matched as closely as possible the basketball bracket for 2024. And then I also went through the top 64 seeds in all the matchups football from 2023 and what a 64 team would have looked like from 2023, starting with overall number one seed Michigan taking on a 16th seed Auburn, actually, in the first round. So go over to the main channel, folks. Check that out. It's just just a fun exercise to do that and look at some of the possible matchups that we could see in that kind of expanded college football playoff that hopefully we will never see because for as much as on one hand we could say no football is too much football, that's impossible. Yes, we, we, were, we were gutted with six and six teams making the field, of course, of 64. And, and we get an expanded football bracket this year. So people will be filling out their football brackets in, in, in reality. Like, you know, two games, that's like, I, you could technically call it a bracket, but not really. But, but you know, with 12, okay, you have the 5-12. People might pick a 12-5 upset, like the 12-5. That's going to come from NCAA tournament jargon to college football playoff. So it's, it's going to be a new dawn. Is it going to be nearly as exciting and interesting as filling out a basketball bracket? No, no. Uh, I think it's no. going to be a lot more chalk and predictable and of course less games, but uh, yeah, th those will be filled out for the first time this coming uh, January, December and January. Tim, how are you doing tonight? Doing great. Uh, I'm getting excited for spring ball starts tomorrow. So i um, going to get our first peek at USC. That's going to be exciting. Um, well, and, and, the cap, and the cap you're wearing, you're, are you gonna are you gonna be up at two thirty a.m. for the oh, yeah. Dodgers opener in Seoul? I'm gonna be flying to Korea. Then not the point. Isn't you know that? <laughs> right? Isn't that in the budget? Did you get me a a, a plane ticket? To, no. Uh, uh, no, I will be rec I, I will be uh, recording it, but um, maybe I'll catch maybe I'll catch a little bit of you know. No, I won't. Even the end of the game, I'll still be asleep. So no. It does bring up the point that that was always a missed opportunity for Larry Scott, George Klyavkov, and the Pac-12. You know, a little midnight football. You know, like like you know, give your I'm and I'm serious. Give your lower end programs some exposure, uh, given that you know you, you, they were buried on Pac-12 Network. I'm sure ESPN two would put on a game middle of the night on a late August Friday, and you know. And the other point I've made, and we've talked about this, you know, with the hot weather conditions in late August, perfect time to play an overnight game when the temperatures are going to be cooler. People would definitely show up in, you know, beautiful Corvallis, Oregon, you know, in the Willamette Valley, all those uh, forests, pine trees, you know, they, they come out for a late night game at research. So missed opportunity, you know, it re just being reminded of this Dodger 2.30 uh, a.m. game uh, coming up on Wednesday and Thursday in Korea. That is a great point, Matt, because when I was at the network and during that time, probably I would say in the range of 10 to 15 years ago, you saw this just explosion of live events. 
And gone were the days of the exercise shows and the fishing shows and all this business because it was determined even low-end sports that people at one point didn't consider. Who's going to watch softball? Who's going to watch some of these? No, people love live sports. And it was determined you put on anything live and it's going to outrate anything except the very rare top of the line studio shows every time. And yes, Matt, remember the conversations we had when we were trying to save the Pac-12 and saying, here's a window of an opportunity here. Here's another one over here. But you just unveiled another one there at midnight. That would have been exceptional. And for geeks like me on the East Coast, hey, it's, a, it's only nine o'clock at night. Big deal. And, and we remember like the college hoops, 24 hour marathon, you know, you have Sacred Heart and Merrimack at 6 a.m. in the East. Students are in the stands wearing pajamas. Like people love that. People love that. And all three of us, like Tim, you're like, I, I think I'm the youngest of the bunch. If I'm not, it's we're pretty, pretty similarly aged. We are, the three of us are all old enough to remember ESPN's infancy. And ESPN would show like badminton or, or, or you know, indoor soccer, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the middle of the night. And they dump it on and like, yeah, like that, those were cult favorites. Like it, and it was a revelation in the 1980s. Like, wow, these things exist because they never did exist. And ESPN brought that into our lives. I'm not going to lie. I was watching MTV, Matt. I wasn't watching badminton or <laughs> <laughs> whatever they were going on. <laughs> You know what yeah. I would watch back in those days on ESPN was Australian rules football in oh, the middle oh, of the yeah. night. Yes. And, and, and just to draw the time, there was a Pac-12 game. I think it was Cal versus Rice in Sydney, Australia, played overnight. And, like, you know, every, everyone was in on that game. So, you know, it, it, it was Cal and Rice, but it was live football at the beginning of the season. You know, so so who cares that it was in the middle of the night? And that and that's something the Pac-12 should have leaned into. But of course, the Pac-12 is dumb, and that's why the pac 12s dead. Evolve or die. That's that's, that's life, right. That's right. And for six or seven games out of the year, there was already a Hawaii game kicking off at eleven thirty Eastern time anyway, and you could upgrade that significantly with Oregon State and Washington State or whomever. Absolutely. Absolutely. Growing up with Garrett Gabriel in those beautiful deep green Hawaii uniforms, man, that, that was, those were the, those were the days, man. USC football fans. We appreciate you being here. The voice of college football, leave those comments and questions. Uh, the super chats available to you as well. Matt's here. Tim's here. And uh, here we go. Uh, the all important offensive line we've been discussing over and over and over from all different angles. Well, this is a huge one. Jonah Monheim has been moved to center. He will be the center uh, for 2024. So, Matt, do you want to start us out in regards to how significant you believe that move is? Well, you know, the people who follow USC football very closely, especially those at 247 Sports, they've said, like, it's been pointing this way the whole time. So, like, for USC insiders, this does not rate as any sort of surprise at all. But I think, you know, what what the real significance of this, I think there, there are two main top line reactions for me. One is you want your best offensive lineman to either be the left tackle or the center. So, and they they – the, the staff feels that Jonah Monheim is, is best suited to be center. So like, that's good. Like he, he was USC's best offensive lineman last season. So having him captaining the ship at center, that makes me feel good. That makes me feel confident. Now, the part that makes me feel less confident, you know, now how does Josh Henson deal with the, the shuffling, the transitions, putting the right pieces in place along that offensive line. And, and again, he did a great job in 2022 with Bobby Haskins filling in the transfer from Virginia that really plugged a lot of holes, was able to hold the fort when Justin Dietrich briefly got injured, when Andrew Voorhees got injured briefly uh, in that 2022 season. Henson was able to mix and match two years ago, but the mixing and matching suffered last year. Gino Quinones, you know, that particular injury really hurt USC 
you know, I would say more than it probably should have. And that's not to dismiss or downgrade the quality of Gino Quinones, but like you, you, we didn't go into 2023 thinking Gino Quinones is going to be the linchpin, you know, that the anchor of this offensive line. And yet when he went out, like the, the quality of that offensive line definitely dipped. So it, this move puts a spotlight on left tackle where one would think Elijah Page is probably going to be the guy, but really Josh Henson has to figure out the right combinations. Who's going to be right tackle. That becomes even more of a point of focus as well with, with Monheim at center. So it opens up a lot of possibilities. Tim. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll be a lot there. I think what allowed this definitely to happen was the emergence of Elijah Page. I was talking about that bumper crop of freshmen that they were bringing along, you know, and since bringing along slowly, and uh, we saw it come together in that in, in that Holiday Bowl. Um, you know, these these guys, uh, Michael Van Willows is, is is hurt, but you know, you were thinking who was going to play center? Zanamella. You know, even you, you don't really want a, like a redshirt freshman or freshman center. You know, uh, hurt or not hurt. I mean, I'm sure eventually Michael Van Willows will, will be pushing. Zanda Mello, those, those, those are our centers of the future, I think. Um, but this is the best situation, like you said, Matt. Putting him inside, we know our tackles are emerging. Those young guys I've been talking about, they are emerging. It shows the confidence that uh, that Riley and Henson have in, in those young tackles, the fact that they're going to move him inside. The, this move is going to be eventual because he's, his, he's projected to be an interior offensive lineman in the NFL. And I think that's one of the reasons why he came back Maybe get some film, uh, you know, show show scouts. Hey, not only can I play in, outside, but I'm also inside, you know, where my measurables probably stack up a little bit better. And um, I, I think that this is going to be a good opportunity for him as well as for USC. That probably means you're going to see, uh, you know, Pregnion got a lot of tr- uh, crap last year. The guy, you know, he came in. He was a, he's a young lineman. Guy got A lot of these guys just got thrust in there. And the reason why that happened was is they're expecting Ethan White, who was a guard from Florida, big SEC guard. Did not clear medical, uh, the medical, did never really made it to the team. And then whatever happened with, you know, Kingston and Tarquin on the other side, on the right side, it just didn't work out, right? So that we didn't know that that white, the loss of white in preseason, and then Quinones going down early in the season, just how much that really caused havoc on the offensive line. And the we know that's where your office is. It starts up front. And when that offensive line caved, you know, people were, <laughs> craziness we have people called our show at time mark talk about oh yeah caleb williams wasn't this and wasn't that i'm just like shaking my head what are you people talking about you know did you not see he was running for his life in that in that notre dame game didn't you see that you know he had no time to throw he he didn't go from being a heisman trophy winner to a bum you know what i mean something happened and what happened was they just couldn't get that offensive line to gel two things this says to me mark and matt is one uh, I, I think that there's the line calls. You know, you're talking about a veteran line. He's gonna make it. He's he's he knows this line. He knows the offense. He'll be inside. He was he was rated by PFF one of the best offensive tackles in the country. Now you move him inside. Um, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna give Miller Moss a lot of um, a lot a lot of uh, rest restful sleep knowing that he has him up in the middle. You know, basically the the quarterback of the offensive line. I think that's a really that's a really good point there, Tim. You know, just let's just like it's not as though Caleb Williams was ever, ever, ever in a million years going to come back to USC for 2024. But if we had just imagine a hypothetical situation in which Caleb Williams was going to be USC's quarterback, you wonder if this move would be made. You you wonder if uh, USC would have felt the need to put Monheim at center. But I think you you zeroed in on it. Giving stability and a veteran presence for Miller Moss in that center quarterback relationship, you know, basically the equivalent of pitcher catcher in baseball, Give, putting the veteran with Miller Moss at the beginning of this season. That's really important that, that I think that is a significant factor in all of this. So that's a great point by you, Tim. Other thing that I'd mention: doing this now before the spring, you offer a like, this like it's not an accident that Lincoln Riley mentioned this, but right before spring practice starts, because that's a message to everyone else on that offensive line. Okay, Monheim's the center. Like when we're just putting it out there, being very public and direct about it. Like we're not going to play coy. You know, we're not going to try and uh, be sneaky or or wait. No, we're going to put this out here. So message sent. 
guys who need to need to establish some firm tackles, firm guards, especially on the right side. You know, if Elijah Page can lock down left tackle, really the focus is probably going to shift mostly to the right side of the offensive line with Mason Murphy, Tobias Raymond, others in play. But it's sending a message right before the spring, hopefully to motivate those guys competing for spots on the right side of that offensive line. And so you're hoping that you'll see uh, a really responsive, robust uh, spring from those uh, competitors on the right side. And if you don't get the results that you're looking for, then this is the next domino, the next piece of the puzzle. If you don't get the intended results your, or progression, evolution that you are hoping for at USC uh, on the right side of the offensive line in the spring, that might move the needle toward getting an offensive tackle rather than a defensive tackle in the spring portal window, which begins on April 16th. So a lot of dominoes all lined up. And I, it's I, like there's it's no accident that this this seed was planted. This message was sent right before spring practice. And, and this is a great point by Walter. Riley walked into an empty cupboard. He, he did. The, the guys, the front, the front line guys were, were great. And, and you know, bring a uh, bring in. Um, I just say his name, uh, the left tackle um, in 22, Matt. 22 left tackle, Matt. You said his name. What's his name again? No? Oh, tw 22. Well, Haskins, Haskins, Haskins played, Bobby. played some left tackle. Yeah, but yeah, they moved well, him around. Yeah. Moved well, both tackle, but um, that showed you the issue that they had on, uh, you know, with the depth. But last year, it showed you again. But with the bad news comes the good news. Uh, we're talking about the right side. You could have Alani Noah moving over there. This is a very, he was a true freshman, but he was a massive true freshman. So you could have Pregnant and, and uh, Alani Noah with Monheim in the middle. That's a lot of beef up the middle uh, for the, I'm sure, I can't imagine that 22 line compared to this one, just the actual size differences can be pretty, pretty massive. Um, and I, 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 we have our good uh, buddy here, Gary from Data Point. No, Gary, I think that moving him to center shows the strength of this line. If he, they didn't, because he, he's a very good tackle. The fact they have the, the confidence to move him inside shows you the confidence they have of those guys you know, the Tobias Raymond's on the outside. Um, it's, it's, it shows you that they're, they're, they feel like Elijah Page and, and Raymond and, and uh, those guys will be able to lock down those tackle positions. They are kind of playing him out of position last year. This is an interesting point. So G Gary from Dana Point uh, with the comment here and obviously one of our best callers on uh, our Friday show with Tim. I, I would make this point. I, I, fun I fundamentally agree with Tim that it points to like they're trusting these younger guys at the tackle spots. But I think Gary from Dana Point has something to say here because it did it does show that USC had a, a deficit or a gap at center. Like there wasn't a true center. And, and the fact that Monheim hasn't primarily been playing center and now you're putting him at center, like that is a less than ideal situation. But I do think that in, in terms of like giving Miller Moss the best center quarterback relationship, in terms of giving Miller Moss the most stability, the best possible chance of succeeding, Monheim at center, like that is an enhancement. So I, in many ways, this, this this cuts in both directions. I think Gary uh, from Dana Point has uh, that like there's there's a definite core element of truth, but I but I would ultimately say that Tim's point about this being a, a show of strength like they're trusting the young guys at the tackle spots um i i finally agree with tim there obviously this this makes spring practice that much more important for those tackles to prove <laughs> that that they uh do belong that they're ready to take on this this big responsibility uh at those tackle spots and, and one more thing i forgot about so we talked about White, who never made it in the door. We talked about Quinones that went down. We also forget that that Cortland Ford um, portaled out to was it Tennessee? I can't remember. Um, Kentucky, Kentucky, and so th those three things that bam, bam, bam. That's what really destabilized that that, that offensive line and really uh, left a lot of points on the board uh, that USC probably would have scored with all three of them being healthy and on that line. Guys, what about this component to it? 
how would you rate USC's offensive line last year in just pass protection alone on a scale of one to 10? Six. Yeah, it's about fair. Six. Okay. How much? Like I certainly wouldn't. I certainly wouldn't put it anywhere near eight point five or nine. Like not not particularly close to being you know top tier. So this is a rough estimate that maybe Caleb Williams makes up for two points of deficiency on a scale of one to ten. So how much better do they have to be if they were somewhat mediocre, insufficient to make up for the Caleb Williams factor? to protect a Miller Moss instead of a Caleb Williams. The, 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 the game that Caleb and Miller appeared to play, and I'm gonna, this is just looking off of last year, they're two different quarterbacks. And um, it, it looks like Miller is more the kind of guy that's going to get that, you know, get the ball out in rhythm on schedule, you know, in the pocket wants and, and we'll throw, throw it away if, you know, if need be uh, that also, well, they both they both I mean, you think they both help the offensive line, right? The way Miller plays the, the game, and the way uh, Caleb's able to have that sixth sense, that pocket presence, and just ability to take off and break. I mean, I don't think it, I can't remember last time I saw a stronger quarterback than Caleb Williams. Just the way he would just roll tacklers off him. They're just I would say different. I don't know really how to say that. Um, I don't think I think this offensive line is going to be much better than the previous iteration we saw last year. Uh, uh, how much and, and what I got a lot of crap last week for pumping what I think Miller Moss is going to be and slow down, pump the brakes, etc. I, I no one, I'm not saying he's going to be the, you know, the Heisman trophy winner, but I have a lot of confidence in this guy. I mean, he, he walked in that bowl game and it wasn't a fluke. He made a number of great throws. He was able to go through his progressions. The guy's really bright. He's a good leader. Um, I don't think he has to be spectacular. And you know, I think that we forget one thing, Trojan fans. You know who the play caller is, right? You, you know you know the weapons he has around. It's not just Miller Moss against the world out there. You know, he's got some pretty damn good receivers and running backs. And one more thing on the, that we're going to be, I think, Matt, tomorrow, the Jacobius Marks um, article I made. One thing about him, and it was just actually Gabe over at Trojan Blaze what pointed this out to me. His PFF rate for, for pass blocking was quite high. It was, I think it was like, you know, 78 or 80 for, uh, grade for pass blocking, which 70 is average. So he's above average as a pass blocker. That's just one more layer, right, you have in the protection scheme for, for Miller Moss back there if you've got a back that can block very well. It does bring up the point that precisely because Miller Moss does get the ball out more quickly, that does make – the decision to entrust the tackle spots and, and Roy Ben Wellows just comes in and makes that same point. Like the, the, the Miller's Miller Moss is going to help the linemen, you know, feel that like they don't have to carry as much of the workload. They don't have to hold their blocks yeah. as long uh, within this setup. So like, it's all of a piece, it's all tied together and that, but that now leads to the point where, you know, like LSU also Michigan, early season opponents on, on USC's 2024 schedule. Like they're going to be aware of this, right? Like, you know, Miller Moss gets the ball out quickly. So you know that they're going to be jumping routes, or at least they're going to be, you know, planting that seed about jumping routes uh, early in the game. You know, the, Miller Moss is going to get the ball out quickly. And, and Miller Moss and Lincoln Riley, they will need to have a plan for that. Like quick slant, Double they move. Can, no, they make, get sure, times make sure defenses aren't just jumping on that. Make sure you have like a double move or some kind of variation to be ready to counter what defenses are likely to do, knowing all of this. So, so like sets up some early drama for that LSU game. Makai Lemon, Makai Lemon. I, 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 I don't want to over pump people. You guys just remember that name. Everyone's looking at Deuce Robinson. Everyone's looking at uh, Jacoby Lane. They, they keep they keep drooling, and, and for good reason uh, to be drooling. But you guys get ready because uh, you saw a little bit of it in that in that Holly Bowl. But Mikai Lemon, in his own right, is a really special receiver, and um, they're not they're not going to be able. I mean, if they start jumping routes, Matt, they're going to get they will get burnt. It's you know that's how you fight it. You just go over the top of them. If they want to jump routes, then let, let's see what, let's see what this um, the receiving core can do. This is reminding me of two series I would like to get to in the summer. One would be 
to bring on at least the key opponents media during the summer. We'll do it, of course, game week, but during the summer, kind of a two or three month outlook at first and foremost, LSU, USC, got a great LSU guy I can bring on for that. And then also with Tim pumping up Miller Moss, I would love for us to go through uh, prior to the season, a stats prediction position by position of uh, where you guys forecast these stats still. And I'll jump into the mix myself uh, of where these guys will land uh, both sides of the football uh, stats for 2024. Scooby, uh, just we'll get really quick, Mark. Scooby, thank you for the, uh, the super chat. Appreciate you being here as always. Thank you so much for support and uh, slap happy. Miller stays in the process. So uh, thank you, Slap, for being here. As always, you're, you're you're one of our most consistent consistent guys here. And Roy, again, the, these young receivers, they they are studs. And um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm excited to see what they can do. And so getting open a lot more quickly than uh, Dorian Singer and Mario Williams did in 2023 that <laughs> that will help enormously. <laughs> Dorian Singer, uh, a disappointment to me, considering what he did. Uh, with Arizona the pre the season prior, we're talking about an 80, 85 catch guy with over a thousand yards uh, the previous season. And and like there was a memorable USC ori origin story with Singer. You know, the, the, he was making all those circus catches against USC in Tucson in 2022. And Caleb Williams said, now, "Can we get this guy?" You know, so like and and. When he came aboard, like I was really excited. I won't speak for anyone else, but like I thought, hey, the circus is coming to town. We have our Jordan Addison replacement. Not that Dorian Singer had the same skill set as Jordan Addison. They're very different kinds of guys. But I thought like, you know, hey, this guy's going to make contested catches. He's going to make big plays. Uh, you know, he's going to score a lot and didn't happen. And one of the things that I... You know, some people might remember me saying this like months ago, like we were, we were doing our postseason uh, postmortem, uh, but it's worth just digging up this point. One of the USC beat writers at 247 mentioned that uh, Dorian Singer didn't fit Lincoln Riley's scheme, that it didn't play to his ability to uh, catch 50-50 balls, that Lincoln Riley's scheme didn't, you know, involve as many 50-50 balls. Like to, and that always struck me as weird. Not the reporting, because the reporting is credible. I'm just talking about the idea of a scheme uh, leaning into 50-50 balls. If a scheme's leaning into 50-50 balls, that's not much of a scheme. The whole point of a scheme is that you're getting guys open within the flow and the connectivity of your offense. And so I reiterate the point that if if Dorian Singer personally felt that he needed to be in an offense where he was going, going to get a lot of 50-50 balls. That was a big miscalculation on his part, and it was a miscalculation on Lincoln Riley and USC's part for thinking that that could be integrated. There really seemed to be some cross signals and some different motivations from the USC side and from Dorian Singer's side. So with, with this young group, you know, it's that like they're being brought up within the offense, the structure, the, the structure that Miller Moss trusted in the Holiday Bowl. That gives me so much more confidence that you're going to see guys getting open because they're going to be trusting the system, how to get open, how to run their routes precisely and professionally. They're not going to rely on catching 50 50 balls the way Dorian Singer did at Arizona. Um, Caleb didn't, Caleb Williams didn't throw him many 50, 50 balls because Caleb Williams wanted to make the clean, uh, big play. And often, of course, that, that hurt Caleb Williams in the offensive line because Caleb Williams took more time than, than he needed or, or took more time than he could afford. But anyway, with Miller Moss and this young group all, you know, all coming up together and showing what they could do as a collective whole in the holiday bowl. You should see a lot more of receivers getting open with crisp route running and, and targeted routes and, you know, immediate bursts of action. And of course, these guys have the speed to get open quickly to help more Moss within the structure of the USC offense. And you made a big point of that, Matt. You, you talked about the lack of separation receivers were getting, which 
had Caleb holding onto the ball a bit longer, which had the offensive line either holding or breaking down. It was just this kind of thing. And it, you, you did it kind of said it, it started with the lack of separation. And I, I think you hit it. I, I think I do remember that the, it was the 247 guys. And they talked, they were talking about it wasn't as much, I don't think the scheme, Matt, as it was the fact that I, I that. Caleb wasn't wasn't apt to throw that that tight window throw or or throw that 50 50. He wanted to throw guys open or throw the guys are open. Yeah, maybe he just didn't trust Dorian Singer. I don't know why, but I mean, he wouldn't he wouldn't throw that ball that that he was getting um, quite often when he was at Arizona. So before we move on to whatever the next topic is, that could be pro day, that could be a number of things that we see here in the chat. Uh, just to make a note here, Chris Carter, who was a recruiting analyst with Lincoln Riley at uh, Oklahoma, also director of player development here at USC for two years, moving on to UCLA. Just make note of that. I don't know if you guys had any thoughts about uh, that front office move. No, nothing big. I don't know if Tim has anything to add. I would just say USC has the vast majority, you know, USC won on the ledger sheet in terms of uh, transactions involving the two programs with Danton Lynn, uh, John Humphrey, uh, and and the other guys that uh, USC got from UCLA. And and Dave so, Emmerich's doing a great win. job, I believe, in, in that role for USC. So we're not looking, but listen, if he works out at UCLA, we'll just go. We'll just go take him like we do all the time with the Bruins. We'll just if, they, if there's something we want over Westwood, we feel deem it necessary. We'll go and take it. That's that's kind of what we've been doing lately. Pro day, pro he's day. Let's hit that. Feature the guy we've been talking about. Uh, when Caleb Williams, he's going to be the headliner. Uh, that's going to draw all the attention. But Matt, uh, what are your eyes going to be directed toward? Well, you know, just uh, just the one note about Caleb Williams is that with the Justin Fields trade going through so that, like, you know, obviously it would seemingly clear the path for the Bears. But I think the plot point of Pro Day is what about other teams? And, you know, the Minnesota Vikings already have a USC quarterback, Sam Darnold. But what are if you know, when they when the Vikings evaluate Caleb Williams at his Pro Day? And if Caleb Williams is like so spectacular and just puts on a show, will that motivate the Vikings or another team that can use a franchise quarterback? Will that motivate them to put forth a rainmaker, King's ransom, you know, all the crown jewels type offer to the Bears for number one? Uh, you know, will will a team be motivated to trade up based on what they see from Caleb Williams at Pro Day? So that, that's an interesting plot point. Just because the Justin Fields trade occurred before – Pro day. So that at least, you know, creates that plot point, whether it's going to lead into anything, you know, highly doubtful, you know, I'm, it's 99% that the bears are, are with Caleb, but it does op at least open up that plot point in a way that that door never would have opened if fields was still with the bears on this USC pro day on Wednesday, March 20th. So the other main, uh, plot points for me for USC on pro day, I'm not really focusing on uh, linemen because, you know, that just wasn't uh, a point of strength uh, for USC last season. I think the really intriguing guys are Taj Washington, Christian Roland Wallace, and Kalen Bullock. Uh, Christian Roland Wallace and Kalen Bullock because, you know, as we've discussed on previous shows here uh, at the Voice of College Football, they're probably going to play different positions in the NFL compared to what they had here. You know, we got into a big Alex Grinch, Dante Williams conversation. We don't need to relitigate that, but just like just mentioning for our viewers here, you know, that was a dis part point of discussion in previous weeks. So if these guys are taking on different roles compared to what they had at USC, well, this pro day is a chance for them to show their stuff and to see if they can stick in the NFL, if they can uh, make some money, rise up the draft board, per perhaps in a new role. So Roland Wallace, uh, and Bullock are going to be very interesting for that reason. And then Taj Washington, you know, and, and so I'm on record as saying that this could be the Amon Ross St. Brown of this upcoming NFL draft. Yeah. Taj Washington gets to sh prove people wrong. He gets to, you know, catch passes from Caleb Williams. It's just a great situation for him. Chance to really impress a lot of people. Amon Ross St. Brown was criminally uh, undervalued at number 112 
in the draft. And so many teams in need of receivers passed him up in that 70 to 100 range in the back end of round three on day two of that draft. He, he, he stayed on the board until Saturday, and the Detroit Lions got a franchise-changing steal. And I think that Taj Washington, I wouldn't say he's gonna, he's likely to have the same level of impact that Amon Ross St. Brown has had because Amon Ross St. Brown's impact has been enormous. But I do think that there's a comparison here in that these guys are undersized. You know, they're going to be dis downgraded by a lot of scouts and a lot of evaluators just because of some of the quote unquote measurables. But Taj Washington's a winner. He gets open. He finds a way. I want him on my team. I'd go to bat uh, for him. I'd ride or die with him. And so really hoping that Taj Washington has a very successful pro day that increases his draft stock, maybe gets him into the back of day three or day two, round three uh, of the yep. upcoming NFL draft. Deceptively fast in and out of, uh, out of cuts. Guy gets open, especially in zone when we needed that third down. Who did he, who was always looking for? It was Taj Washington. Time and time again coming in with that, with that big catch. Uh, great hands, good high point when he needed to. Yeah, I'm with you, Matt. I mean, he will absolutely be a steal. Someone's going to get a, a high value at, at a good price. Uh, whoever is smart enough to, to, to uh, take a flyer on Taj Washington. You see that 2023 season with over a thousand yards and eight touchdowns on 59 receptions. He's played a ton of football going back to 2019 at Memphis. He has tallied 54 games in his college career. So this is a seasoned guy who has just logged a lot of reps, a lot of targets and uh, I'll go to a music analogy of what they say about garage bands. You know, you're about ready if you've got the talent and potential at about a thousand reps to to hit the big stage and show your show your your best at that point. But uh, that's a lot of football out of him, and he certainly saved the best for his final two seasons with Caleb Williams and USC. Thank you, Jeff. Loyal viewer, loyal friend of the Voice of College Football and our USC shows both on Monday and Friday. Thank you very much for that super sticker. Enormously appreciated. And here we have uh, Point Priamos. Thank you for your $10 uh, contribution here. And you have the question, will 55 be worn anytime soon? And I, and I think the point to make here is that so many USC fans I'm not going to say majority, but like a significant chunk. Let's just say a significant chunk of USC fans were clamoring for Tackett Curtis to get the big double nickel. Like that was a big thing. You know, oh, this guy's going to be the best, you know, and let, let's wait for this to be earned. That's what I'm going to say. You, you, you don't just have it given to you, this kind of privilege, this kind of status, this kind of cachet. No, you earn it, then you get it. So, like that—that's my main thing. That there was there was so much premature uh, hype about Taggart Curtis, and 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 it, and it's not even to say the hype wasn't warranted because he was an exciting prospect. But Alex Grinch was coaching him; that was a problem. And, and so, you know, the hope is that USC is going to have a, a linebacker or two or three who, under Matt Entz and Danton Lynn are going to blossom and become rock stars. And then we can begin to consider a conversation. Um, but but it, really, that's the main thing, that, that USC needs to reclaim and recover lost accountability. There was not accountability on last year's defense. And the way you reclaim accountability is not by handing the double nickel uh, to anybody at the beginning of a season based on potential, based on hope, no, you wait for the season to play out. You wait for someone to play at that uh, elite level. And then we can have a discussion about conferring that weighty honor on someone. So th that is such an important part of coaching, teaching. And it's not just about football. It's about life that, you know, you, uh, growing up, becoming a man, becoming an adult, you have to earn certain things before they are given to you. you like if you give something to someone before that person's earned it, that person doesn't learn the value of hard work. He doesn't learn the value of perseverance. He doesn't learn the value of homework and study and developing and, and 
learning from failure, all those things that are just a part of becoming uh, becoming successful in any endeavor. So that is really the message about number 55. But one thing that I, I've had people bring up with me and I've talked about and I've heard as well, at one point, Matt, if you, you don't use it, you lose it. You know, And I get it, us guys, but I mean, we're talking what? When was our last big 55? It, it, it started back with, with Junior Seau, really, the 55, you know? Um, and then you had Chris Claiborne, Claiborne. Steele. Right? So you, but, but it's been a long time since you've seen that double nickel on the field for USC. And I get what you're saying. You can't just throw it on anybody. But also, when does it begin to lose its luster if it's just never given out? I mean, we're just going to wait. Because at some point, these high school kids aren't really going to get, you know, what is to wear, you know, a 55 at USC. I, you know, I would say something to the effect of, hey, let's win a conference championship. Hey, let's win a New Year's Six Bowl. Hey, let's make the college football playoff. You know, you help us do one of those things. Then you get the 55 for the next season. Seems to get more excited. Seems to me like the right set of incentives, incentives, you know? Seems yeah. to me like the right set of incentives. I agree. But it, it, it just we we have to get that. We just got to get that that inside linebacker, and we just need to to get someone to wear it. I think because I just for me it just seems like it's been so long since it's been worn. You know, I don't know. It's got something to think about. Another something to think about, everyone, is becoming a YouTube channel member here at the Voice of College Football USC. Uh, Matt and I have produced 14 bonus segments and uh, we will be geared up and ready to go to deliver some more this spring and summer. Let us get past basketball, meaning get Matt past basketball. And uh, when we get a breather, we will start to produce some great segments again. But uh, some choice cuts, as Matt likes to say, with 14 bonus segments and all that uh, we deliver. And uh, the three of us are going to get together here in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, again, once we get past uh, basketball and uh, uh, deliver maybe even a little bit more, depending on um, what is decided. But uh, just uh, we've got bonus content for you as a YouTube channel member. So we appreciate everyone who has made that decision. Thank you so much for that. And uh, so consider that as well. And also, I think Matt made a good point just a few minutes ago, considering some of the, the previous conversations. Folks, uh, during the off season, only about five or 10% of these conversations get stale. Uh, most of them uh, are significant and relevant for weeks and weeks and months. So if you've missed any of the previous shows, head on back and check them out. Uh, they are still relevant today. Willie, we appreciate your uh, super chat contribution. Thank you so much for that, sir. Fight on fellas. Ready to see this defense hit the field in spring and see what we have moving forward. So That's excited. Be, so thing, excited man. to see this staff develop players, you know, actual teaching, actual development, you know, like we haven't had it for a long time at USC because remember, it wasn't just the last two years of Alex Grinch and Dante Williams. It was Todd Orlando. Uh, definitely, definitely not beautiful downtown Orlando. No, Orlando was a mess. Sam Clancy, uh, Sam Clancy, um, Clancy Fender Gas well. giving up like sixty yeah, points. It, it has just been. It has been a Arizona trail State. of tears. It has been a trail of tears for the Trojans at the defensive coordinator spot. So finally, finally, we have manna in the desert. <laughs> it's our it's our biblical salvation moment uh, at USC. Finally, getting elite defensive coaching cannot wait. And Willie, just uh, uh, again, consistent support from you. Really appreciate you being here. Really appreciate uh, your financial support of the show as well. Another sticker from Gary and Dana Point again. Gary, thank you, you so rock. so much. Look forward to your calls, Gary, every Friday. Absolutely highlight of my week. Love, love those calls. Uh, and uh, Gary, I think you're hitting, I think you're hitting the, the button too many times again. You got another repeat and another one from Gary. Uh, and thank another you. one. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, and then we have Scooby coming back in. Uh, what do you guys think about Makai Lemon emerging as number one with his built up trust with Miller last season? Yeah, that's what I'm that's that's kind of what I'm talking about. I thought it was I thought it was gonna be Malachi Nelson and, and um Makai Lemon. But yeah, Miller's gonna st stepping right in because 
Miller got a lot of reps with the twos. And guess who we're seeing all year? We're going to be seeing all the twos. And so all the, he's going to have a rapport with all these guys, Jacoby Lane, all, all these guys. He, they, they've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of passing reps together. So uh, look for that big jump with all these guys because they are familiar with each other. Absolutely. And, and Scooby, in, in, in my response to that is, you know, it's less about one guy. I mean, it, it's true that when you do have one guy being excellent, the way Jordan Addison was two years ago, that does have a domino effect. When one guy can really dominate on his side of the field in his matchup, you know, that naturally does bring uh, more attention from the defense and it opens up opportunities for the Taj Washingtons. And, you know, two years ago, the Kyle Fords and other guys, you know, in their other complementary routes. But it's less about one guy stepping up. It's more about the whole receiving core being good because, uh, you know, like you had Taj Washington playing well last year, but, you know, it was both. And we, we mentioned Dorian Singer. Let's not forget Mario Williams, also a bust. And so if you had just one of those two guys being significantly better than what they showed, just having one of the two step up would have meant a lot for the offense. So, yeah, I mean, like Makai Lemon could be the guy. But like Jacoby Lane could be the guy. And of course, Zachariah Branch, you know, if, if he develops his route running and can become really polished as a, you know, a, a true technician at wide receiver, you know, obviously he has the natural gifts, the athleticism, the speed, the dynamism. But if he can become a technician as a route runner, then, then that can just. Uh, be a, an absolute game changer for Miller Moss and the rest of the UFC offense. So, like the the, the fun thing, the exciting thing is that you, there are three candidates in my mind that who, who could all really become the guy. Lemons one, Jacoby Lane's another, and Zachariah Branch is, is the other. Three guys who could all be really, really special. And just the main thing is that like everyone is developing and evolving. Uh, with and, and you're offense. you're not even. You're not even talking about too big. Too well. You're not talking about Deuce Robinson, also who could absolutely stretch the field with his size, third downs, goal line. Yeah. He's gonna be something special. And then you, Kyron Hudson, he doesn't get a lot of play, but you know all he does, he just shows up, and makes catches. So again, he might be that glue piece. Yeah. This, you know, it, it's weird to think of him as one of the veteran guys. They they picked up Richardson from Tufts. I don't know how much if he's just maybe a depth piece or what his role is going to be on the team. But uh, it's going. It will be very interesting to see how quickly. I think that the pecking order. I do believe the pecking order will become apparent very early in the season. And so I, I'm, you know, it's trial by fire. To to the 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 three first games are against LSU and Michigan. So this young, and I say young and air quotes, but they're they're so, mainly sophomores, right? Second year guys, so they're freshmen, but they're second year guys. They're gonna have to grow up in a hurry, you know, on the on the road in a neutral field in Vegas against. LSU, and then on the road in the big house in Ann Arbor against the the, the fending national champions. That those are those are two quick games that this young gish receiving core is going to have to put up together. Because you remember, we had one of the best receivers we've had here at USC um, go into Kansas State and and have a couple drops. You know, Mike Williams who went on to be this one of our a, a favorite. Uh, no one one player costs them in the game. But when you're young and you're you're looking to run before you catch the ball, you have a couple drops in those close games. It can be very important. But I do think that these guys are going to be ready. And and just one point to to emphasize, not in terms of this group, but in terms of USC's opponents. You know, we all saw LSU last season, an absolute disaster in the secondary, and so. And, and, and look, folks, I'm not saying Lincoln Riley should abandon the run, okay? <laughs> I'm not saying that. But LS, the LSU game might, I say might, I'm not, gonna, I'm not doing definites here. It might shape up as a game where throwing the ball uh, carries a little more weight and centrality for the USC offense just because LSU couldn't cover a dandelion last year. You know, L LSU couldn't cover anything uh, in the back end. And so if the receivers can really bust out against LSU, Trojans have a chance to ring up a very big number in Las Vegas. This is not your older brother's LSU secondary. Uh, one of our favorite uh, LSU guys, uh, Matt Moscona with uh, ESPN Baton Rouge, says this is the worst 
Now they expect some of the young guys to take hold here in 24, but the worst secondary play, not just the worst secondary play and production, but the worst level of talent he had ever seen at LSU. So they have things to clean up on that side of the ball for sure. Uh, we've got another super trouble. Thank you all so much. This, this keep coming in uh, pretty almost again with, um, you know, I guess that's, I'll go with why is there no special teams coach? This is one of those, this is one of those things that's just an absolute fan favorite question. Um, It's just Lincoln Riley's philosophy. He is not alone in coaching. There's this misconception that Lincoln Riley is this renegade and he just, he doesn't believe in the special teams coach. There, there are many head coaches that follow this philosophy that you don't want to give a full-time coaching position to somebody is just uh, dealing with the with you know special teams, which again is part of the game. Is third, you know, everyone talks about it. You field position, etc. Those those field goals are important, but um, they they have a an analyst Ryan Doherty, I believe. I think that's right. Uh, he he handles the special teams. Um, th- this is a big question. Actually, a good question because Kyle McDonald, I believe, also return was uh, would work with the special teams on on kick returns. Most of the guys on the on this team uh, have you know, have some experience in special teams. So it's not like the special teams coordinator is the one coaching each one of these things. It's usually delegated out, right? But we had Sean Snyder. Remember, oh, you know, his dad at Kansas State was known for for special teams and, and big deal. We're going to, we, he's a come in. How'd that work out? We had this hot shot, you know, and then we had um, Fresno State. Uh, forgot the, the guy's name so quickly under Clay Helton, the, the special teams coordinator who had like 12 scholarship kickers. Um, he, he had him in there and he had once in a while, it was good for a great play, a little trick play, but you know, at the end of the day, how much does that help us win? So, uh, I know that Matt's going to chime in here really quickly. I do think that Doherty's big thing is he, he is a kicking specialist and they allow guys that have kicking, uh, I'm sorry, who have special teams, uh, experience, you know, and on their resume to, to assist in, so it's not like they're not coaching special teams guys. It's not like they just throw the ball out. Okay, guys, good luck. Let's get a good punt off. It's not like that, okay? They, they are being coached. The question is, is do you want to have a dedicated special teams coordinator who just all he does is special teams? Matt, go ahead. Tell me where I'm wrong. You're, you're not wrong. And, and, and the, here's the point I was going to make uh, about this conversation. I mean, like people know where I've stood in past seasons and in past contexts, but USC just brought in a stud kicker. USC just recruited a guy who should be a massive upgrade over Dennis Lynch. And so if you're not going to have a special teams coordinator, which is, you know, again, it's, that's a defensible position, but you better have the elite performers at these crucial hinge point spots uh, who, who can do the job. And USC seems to have a place kicker who is going to be lights out. I mean, and hopefully – you know, that's going to be the case. And if so, like that reduces it, the the uh, you know, longevity, the endurance of that talking point about uh, uh, not having a special teams coordinator. If you have a kicker who can just, you know, mop up and and uh, do it, do his job with relentless consistency, a consistency Dennis Lynch did not bring to the table. You know, he got the scholarly, he got the scholarship and then his performance declined. Whoopsie, you know, you, you, you need a stone cold killer uh, at the place kicker spot. And USC seems to have recruited a guy who can can do that. And if that's the case, then the value or the importance of not having a special teams coordinator goes down. So, Tim, like, see, I, I wasn't nearly as much of a bad cop as you might have been uh, bracing for there. <laughs> I thought you were winding up. You're ready to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Coming. Well, Zipliki, Zipli- he, he came over from... Zaplisky, he came over from Arizona State, and I believe he was all you know first team or second team all conference punter. So I mean, you know, with the kicking game sorted out, you know, Dennis did have lots of inconsistency. He, he boomed that fifty-three or fifty-four yard field goal. I can't remember how long it was, but then on those chip shots, he just became a bit inconsistent. Th- these games, remember, you guys, we're going to the Big Ten. It's not the sling it out Pac-12. Points might be at a premium in some of these games, and missing field goals is a, is a perfect way to lose games. Absolutely a horrible way to lose games. And, of course, especially now that USC is moving into the Big Ten, placing more of an emphasis on running the ball, more of an emphasis on controlling the clock, and you know more of a chance that you know 
you play one of those uh, 11 a.m. games in Iowa or Illinois on a, on a foggy, damp, you know, late October, early November morning, you need your kicker to d regularly deliver three points. Like you, you go into Kinnick, you need to be prepared to win 15-12, baby. Mark Rogers knows all about that. <laughs> so be, you know, yeah. it, going into the Big Ten, the value of, of having a, a, a lights out kicker is uh, multiplied exponentially. When you when you're when you have less possessions coming up empty from the 40, you know, that could be just between the game. And to your point, Tim, there are less college football teams today employing special teams coordinators than at any other time. It's just being moved into other positions on the coaching staff. It's not necessarily being ignored or anything like that. Uh, and we're talking about some of the best programs in the country have dropped special teams coordinators and delegated that elsewhere. Uh, we've talked about it here. I've talked about it elsewhere. I've actually presented the, the, the numbers and the stats. Just the way the game has been changed from a rule standpoint has uh, limited the number of plays on special teams and the number of plays in which there is real activity that are not dead plays. Uh, the punting has become so good. The adoption of the Australian Aussie style punting that is rarely returned. The, the amount of kickoffs that are returned is minimal compared to what it was 10 years ago. If you take the leader in kickoff returns as a team from last year and you just randomly go back 10 years, they're going to be about middle of the pack in the country. There are far less kicks and punts being brought back uh, for a number of reasons than there were. Uh, even just 10 years ago. And to your point, Tim, uh, our guy, uh, John Baxter, is the special teams coordinator you were thinking of from Fresno State. Uh, there was good reason they brought him in. During his time at Fresno State, uh, the Bulldogs led the nation in punt blocks. Fun fact there. He What's just, uh, I, I brought him up because, Mark, he he leaves a, a bad taste in a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, well, it's just a part of it is just you know he just was part of that regime, but also uh, the the word was is a lot of I mean an extraordinary amount of, of practice time was spent on special teams and for what output you know when when the rest of the team when your offensive defense is struggling as bad as it was under Helton you're spending that much time on the special teams that's was kind of, that that was kind of the, the point I was trying to backwards make yeah uh, yeah you know, it's John Baxter yeah and uh, we we had a Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Sorry. And I was just going to say, to make my point clear, that doesn't mean that you allow the special teams to go. You have to address it. It has to be addressed. And a lot of head coaches have uh, you know, a significant background in, uh, in special teams, and that's one way for them to become more familiar with the entirety of the squad uh, is to coach special teams. Connor Johnson, uh, another friend of the show and then of the of the all the channels, uh, bringing up the two beeves that came in. Uh, there's there's a Keeley Arnold who's a, a safety, and then also Easton Macarenas Arnold who is is the linebacker, which I'm really interested to see. This guy's an NFL linebacker, and uh, just played lights out last year. Uh, it's coming to USC. It, it, he's going to be right there with that that, that middle linebacker position. Is going to is going to be a pretty sick competition. It's one of the better competitions you're going to see in the spring. It's going to be. I mean, the safety. This is. We're, there's a great. It's a great time to have this defensive staff because there is a lot of talent that they've amassed on defense at safety, at corner, and at linebacker. You guys. And I'm not even talking about the off the def, uh, defensive line yet. I'm just talking about those skill positions. There's a lot of talent, and, and the cream is gonna is gonna rise to the top. Uh, and I, I think you can almost bank on um, Mascarenas Arnold. You can almost pencil him. I, I, I honestly think I don't. I don't know. I have no inside information. I'm just kind of thinking. You know, he and Cobb are going to slug it out in the spring. Both guys, you know, came in as as like all conference selections, I believe, at their position. I'm not judging um, Mason Cobb on last year. We all know the mess that they he was they were thrown into, especially the linebacker units. So. Um, it's going to be again. It's we're in a great position because there are going to be whoever gets that nod 
And it's not going to be because it was promised to them before they came in high school and came onto the campus. These guys are going to, there's going to be some real competition. You know, Matt and Scott, these guys, the, the pads are going to be popping. I know that, you know, you're, you're going to have that going on. And whoever takes the mantle is going to be the dude. And, you know, again, Arnold's going to play on Sundays. So uh, it's going to be, it's going to be great to see um, what that competition brings. Yeah. The oh, here goes Zombie. State defense. Oh, I was just going to say, took a step back last year, but they were arguably the best in the conference the year before. Mascarenas had 107 tackles last year and two picks, and Arnold had 60 tackles and two picks and six passes defensed. So they lost a lot in the secondary. That's where their corners, and I think they lost the safety. I'm sure Connor can fill us in. I forgot already, but um, this would be amazing. So <laughs> if you have the two of the beefs come in, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what that does. That's a, that's a curious question. What that does for morale on the team? I mean, you bring in two guys in from the portal and they become captains, but or maybe it speaks to their character and they came in and maybe in the off season they're leading by example. They're veteran guys and they're they're hitting it. You know, I I mean, doesn't that send a message though? Like like no one on last year's team was worthy of that level of stature. And so, like, if, if someone on last year's roster wants to get that status, they're going to have to do something special. Like, so right now, that's not the case. So I think mean, that's a message just to the holdovers on this team. I want I want to circle back, though. I, I highlighted Jeff Rodriguez's comment a little bit earlier about, because in the chat, the, the chat's still going on about Monheim and the offensive line. And I know we talk, already talked about it, but before we go, I think it's worth circling back. Jeff made the point. He's not sure about getting a center in the transfer portal. You know, we do have the transfer portal uh, spring window opening up in roughly a month on April 16th. So I want to say I fully agree with Jeff here, like bringing in a, a center through the portal. Like you have to the center and the quarterback have to have their own very easy uh, communication method system rapport that 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 communication dynamic needs to be very fluid, very smooth. You know, it needs to be very instinctual, automatic. So when you're, if you're renting a, you know, a one-year guy in the portal at center, that means these guys have to establish a relationship after the spring. And we're getting into Deion Sanders, Colorado territory, where he, you know, he, he totally overhauled the roster after the spring game, and and it was just throwing a bunch of guys in a blender. And I mean, it, it worked out amazingly well in the first few months, but then reality began uh, to set in as the quality of competition uh, increased. So, yeah, I don't want to get a center in the transfer portal because then Miller Moss has to start from the ground up in terms of a communication dynamic, uh, you know, with that incoming portal center. Definitely just get a, a stud tackle who can just win his one on one battle on an island on the edge like that that just lends itself much more to the portal than a center does so definitely want to express my agreement with jeff there folks we appreciate your time here at the voice of college football each and every monday night with these two and myself it's at uh seven o'clock pacific time and then you can catch matt and tim just about every Friday. Now, of course, we're into March Madness here, and uh, Matt's got a ton of responsibilities to deal with. So just bear with us. We'll get through March Madness. Enjoy March Madness yourself. But we will be here twice a week, most of the time, and uh, we'll be back ready to roll during the back half of spring practice there in April as well. And uh, Tim's going to be covering spring practice, right? Yeah, it's going to be exciting. So just like previous practices, uh, you don't really get to see a lot um, of the practice. It's really just a lot of, you know, just like many programs around the country now, you go, you, you get to see them warm up a little bit, you know, do we do some individual drills and then, you know, then the media is ushered out and then brought in back at the end to talk, you know, to the offense and then talk to the defense. So um some, something along those lines. I know it's not very clear. I'm just going off of what's been done in, in the previous. This will be my first time doing it. Really looking forward to it. I'm excited about the whole situation. Um, and speaking of being excited, if you guys have enjoyed any of the show, please do us a big favor. Hit that like button. And again, it really helps us out. Again, only if you like. If you do like it, that's fine. You don't have to hit it. 
But also, if you guys aren't um, already subscribed, many of you that watch the show are, but a lot of you aren't, just take one second and pop this little button over here. It's the subscribe button. doesn't cost you a penny, uh, but it will let you know uh, if you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell whenever we do go live. So in case you uh, maybe forgot about our Monday night show every night at, at 7 p.m. on Mondays, 10 uh, Eastern on Mondays, and then also the 6 o'clock Pacific, 9 o'clock Eastern uh, show, the call-in show uh, on Fridays. If you forget, it'll pop up, give you a notification. So uh, two things to think about. But as always, we appreciate all of you guys being here. Folks, we go live on Tuesday with uh, Iowa, Nebraska, and Michigan football talk at 5.30, 7 and 8 o'clock Eastern time. So please join us for those shows on those respective channels. And of course, every day at Trojans Wire for USC football and basketball coverage. It is indeed March Madness. Guys, appreciate you making the time as always and making this uh, everybody's destination for USC football talk. Yep, a lot of stuff coming out. A lot of stuff coming out in the next couple of days um, for for spring ball. So make sure you are checking out uh, us on Trojans Wire because I I've got like five stories just waiting for Matt's approval to click them right in. So yeah, I've been publishing the women's basketball bracket March Madness stories over the weekend, and Tim's gets top billing these next few days uh, with the start of spring ball. So yeah, you're gonna see a lot of stories from Tim, and I'm just so thrilled for him that he gets this chance through his involvement with Trojans Wire, giving him this chance to be credentialed uh, to cover USC spring football practice. So just really happy for Tim and looking forward to his uh, coverage of USC spring football. Folks, we will see you on Friday. In the meantime, Trojans Wire with Matt and Tim.